Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Mark Ricks and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Apex Media. You may know us best as the publisher of Oman's biggest selling daily newspaper, Muscat Daily. Supported by the Oman American Business Center, we are very pleased to present today's webinar entitled Educating Our Children in the New Normal. This is a huge subject that impacts our children, parents, teachers, schools, colleges and universities. And there are many big questions to address. For example, what changes are we experiencing already in education and what does the future look like? How will this new normal affect the quality of education? What are the effects on the mental health of students and how are existing and emerging technologies easing the transition in physical and virtual classrooms. And to help answer these and other big questions, we are delighted to welcome our panel of experts today who represent these key stakeholders groups. And our moderator for today's webinar is Dr. Sue Grosbeck, head of school at ABA and IB World School. And my thanks to Sue on behalf of Muscat Daily and all our panelists for giving of their time today for this important discussion and of course to everyone for joining us both in Oman and further afield. I will now hand over to our webinar moderator Dr. Sue Grosbeck. Thank you Sue. And thank you Mark. The topic is very important. Educating our children in the new normal. Our panel of experts in the field of education will discuss the inexorable shift of educational activity to the online environment. How does this impact our children and their studies? Are they equipped physically and mentally? What does this mean for schools and teachers? And what are the short and long-term outcomes likely to be? I'm joined today by a wonderful panel. Rakesh Singh Tomar, the principal of Indian School Bowsher, an academician with decades of experience, and Tommy Bosco, an IT expert, head of technology at Knowledge Oman, and Nutella al karusi founder and managing director of the psychology department at al Harub Medical Center, Rupa Koshi Makal, counseling psychologist and head psychometrist of psych psychometrics at Al Harub Medical Center. Michal Iqbal, a teacher at Al Zain Nursery. And Shakira Wadi, PYP educator at my school private school. Sue Hunt, a parent with a little one. And this is, of course, what it's all about. Suparna Barnaji, mother of two children who study at the Indian school, at, uh, at a school in Darsaid. I'll start tonight today with, with um, Mr. Tomar, a principal at the Indian School at Bowsher. Hi. Uh, hi, how are you today? I'm wonderful, I'm doing great. Yeah, well, you know, on March 18th, we received notice. We were all going to go to online teaching. It was a, a, a absolute seismic shift in education. You're an um, you're an academician with many decades in both as both an educator and you have an MBA and decades of experience. Yet, with no warning, this came. How did you prepare your teachers for this online teaching? Thank you, Sue, for uh, engaging me, being the first uh, panelist. When we heard about uh, the lockdown, it certainly and suddenly brought in a lot of you know chaos and unrest among everybody because we never thought of living a life of a lockdown era but the people we are not new to such type of lockdown in a desert country the weekends generally people they stay in house from 10 to 4 pm in the afternoon and moving from a no school to an online school during the lockdown, what's not as difficult as we were considering initially. The program like Google Do, WhatsApp, Facebook, 
Messenger, Zoom, Skype, we are already used by the school for interviewing teachers from overseas, talking to consultants, doing a lot of virtual trips. So doing things online was not new entirely to the teaching fraternity. And teachers being the front runner, being from an area where they need to be a lifelong learner, we as a school found this as a wonderful opportunity to grow and expand our reach. So what we did, there are schools with a different set of technology integration. Every school is not at the same level. There are schools who have made it compulsory, have provided laptop to every teacher before the COVID-19 came in. There are the schools with a lot of interactive panels. There are schools with the Wi-Fi campus. When we talk about Muscat, Muscat, and its schools were much ahead to meet any online challenge. But the problem was how to make a traditional school move completely. 100% online was something which was making people scary. But there comes the role of a leadership. The leader is a person who builds a working model, educate all stakeholders, spread awareness, and walks the talk and stay optimistic when the time is not good. We as an institution, I as an educator, believe in the model called improvise, adopt, and overcome. COVID-19 gave us an opportunity to change, to improvise, to get ready for something new that was knocking our door. Adopt to it and then overcome. Most of the progressive institutions with the technology integration has found it very easy to move from a campus school to a home school. And the best thing was the parents were also the part of the lockdown. They became our teaching assistant back at home. Their support and availability back at home has given the entire process so much of strength and so much of support that what was looking difficult all alone has become very easy to do. The lockdown was not just for the school. It was for the entire city. The entire family was back at home to support a child with his first full-time interaction with the technology. That made the life of the school very easy to move on. So I, I take this opportunity to thank all the parents who were sitting next to the child, hand-holding the child, and making him interact with the technology and making him cyber safe. So it was not so difficult. It was a wonderful experience of moving from a campus to a home-based learning. And the best thing is, it was not just the child who was the part of education. The entire family got involved in the process. So it was a wonderful way the schools have moved, improvised, adapt, and overcome the challenge of COVID-19. Well, it's, it's wonderful to hear you talk about improvise, adapt, overcome parents and support. My next question was very interesting uh, that you've already answered it. I had talked about this has also been hard on parents, especially working parents. Uh, what, what words of advice do you have for struggling parents who are trying to keep their children's education on track? And it sounds like you are very enthusiastic that this has been a good experience. Is that mostly uh, been your experience? Right. I believe, you know, uh, the parental struggle was more on the job part than on the education and the family part. COVID-19 is a blessing in a terrible disguise. But it, ha it has brought in a lot of good things to the society. It was not a gradual change. It was a mutation, all right? It was such a rapid changes that people were bound to panic. But then there comes something where we have heard a very famous formula, which is called E plus R equal to O. Means event plus your reaction will decide your outcome. Event was COVID-19. You had a choice to blame, to criticize, to cry, or see it as an opportunity. 
most of the parents saw and realized that this is an opportunity to stay strong. When the situation, when especially the financial situation becomes lean, we move on to minimal need requirement. So minimizing our need was something that we all have come down to. Our visit to shopping mall, our traveling, everything has come down. And we all have realized if we don't change, we will become yesterday's dinosaur and we will be finding our place in a museum like an artifact. The change is a constant thing. We have to keep our need to limited. Now we have to differentiate the need. What is a must? What can be delayed? What can be avoided? Anyone who can control his mind, anyone who knows panicking doesn't resolve a problem, is a person who is managing his family affair, who is managing his professional affair, and who is managing his social affair in a very nice way. As far as the schools are concerned, initially 45 days, there was a complete lockdown. Like my first answer, I said, parent was there at home to support. Once the offices have opened, we have moved down to two shift schools. Two shift school means there will I'm be few have classes. I'm going to call you a little quicker. <laughs> right, right. So we have moved down to school in the morning and the school in the afternoon. So those parents who are working in the afternoon can avail a morning class. Those parents who are working in the morning can avail afternoon class. Because some children are small. They are leaving them in the crutch and their relatives. They cannot operate the online classes. So the school have to find out an inventive way of supporting because we as a team, we as a society, we being together can only defeat the impact of COVID-19 in our social, economic and political life. Thank you so much, Rakesh. Okay, I'm going to move on to Tommy Bosco. And Tommy, what I know is you're an IT expert and a multi-award winning expert. Uh, and, and the late Sultan Qaboos had a vision which uh, within 12 years, you were to transform Oman into a knowledge-based society. And you got great awards for that. And thank you so much. And I know you're an optimist. That, that's written all about you. So I'd like to know, Tommy, um, about your optimistic view about the future in everything I read about you. What, what can you say, why are you so optimistic about our future? Um, hi, Susan, uh, thanks for having me. Well, it, it was quite um, interesting to hear Mr. Tomar uh, explain how uh, we have uh, hacked the crisis, if I may say, uh, into turning something, let's say, quite negative into something that eventually will become very positive. Now, um, I think we are living in a huge crisis. Um, as of now, uh, almost 100% of the children in Oman and probably 80% globally um, are, are, are not in school. And the last time I checked the facts, about 173 countries have actually closed down the institutions. Obviously, um, few countries are getting back to the normality. Um, I think the big future, um, according to me, is the availability of the best teachers in the world right in front of you. So, so you can learn from them and you can adapt and you can go with the, with the principles that they're about to teach. Um, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Like 15 years ago, if you, if you look at it, Susan, uh, we were just keeping cameras in front of people and um, recording their sessions and putting these videos online. Um, there, there was no interactivity. There was no real-time communication. Uh, but look at us now. We actually have a um, source of online education. We have interactive sessions. Um, although it's not in a very free form, we will still need to, let's say, tune into a, a website. We still need to use our laptops, etc. But the way I see the future, just to answer your question, I think it should be very uh, much of a free form of education where you can use your mobile phones, your tablets, um, um, uh, have, have like an electronic coach in front of you with whom you can, uh, can communicate, ask the questions, and have access to the best teachers in the world. Um, 
obviously it's going to be opening up new opportunities and and um, there are certain guidelines as well that I would like to maybe even put forth in this in this panel. Um, I believe we've all embarked the journey towards the next 15 years also to be in line with um, in line with the vision that most of the modern countries including Oman have set for the kids. Um, the guidelines are I think schools should already invest in having an e-coach to improve the existing infrastructure for the online education and the, and the digital platform. Um, well, right now educators are trying to find out how can they bring the classrooms to the homes. Um, a while ago, Mr. Tomar said like, um, it, it, it wasn't easy for, for them if it wasn't for the parents to be with the children and to kind of coach them and orient them to go together. Um, of course, we have a lot of um, challenges ahead of us, but one most one of the important things that I would like to say is that while we plan the future to have online education to be available in front of you, like in mobile phones, tablets, and whatnot, we also need to make sure that uh, children with special needs, they're also taken into account. Uh, just to conclude my remarks, I think more and more students are getting the tools that they need to take control of the future. I think this is about time. We are getting there. Thank you. And what is one guideline you feel uh, every individual should follow to make learning a joyful experience? Um, good question, Susan. I think, I think maybe I wouldn't say it's one guideline. I, I would say it will be guidelines towards multiple people. Um, if it's to parents, then parents need to um, spend this time with the kids and to provide them access to the technology, access to the internet, um, uh, to provide them the safety as well of, of, of going online. Um, uh, now, there are, there are, there are uh, so many cases which are reported that uh, kids go online and yes, they, they do the online mechanism to, to study and to learn, but then there's an ad that comes up and then compromises the entire screen that the kid is actually using to study. So I, I think for one guideline for parents is to make sure that um, parents need to make sure the safety of their children is assured while they're online. Now there are several tools to do that, like if in the operating system that they're using, if it's Windows, for example, they can enable uh, parental controls on the, on, the, on, the, on the Windows, which is actually a built-in uh, feature. And I strongly recommend everybody to use that if you haven't used it already and also to enable the activity logging for the children so that the children, the parents will be always notified by email and on demand, what are the activities that the, the children are doing. Uh, could be intentional, could be unintentional, but you have to have a focus. And the same features are also applicable in the Mac OS or the Apple platform as well. And for the, for the, for the, for the schools or the educators, it is very important that we are riding a wave right now, a wave towards digital transformation, but we need to make sure that we use the right tools um, there are several tools available, um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that lots of schools in Oman, private institutions, they're already embracing several top-notch state-of-the-art tools. Uh, for example, Google Classroom, for example, or, or Moodle platform, which is used by several schools as well. But the point is to use the right tool to ensure the safety and the privacy of the kids and the students, and not to use any publicly available uh, options. Now, for example, if you're keeping a webinar through Zoom for the kids, please make sure that these sessions are moderated well and password protected. And if you're using um, uh, interactive uh, learning platforms like Google Classrooms, for example, still there has to be this e-coach that I mentioned before, moderating through the content uh, and, and the discussion forums that the kids are getting into just to avoid cyberbullying and whatnot. And for the kids, I would say go and have fun because the world is your oyster. Thank you so much, Tommy. And we are lucky today uh, to have two, uh, what, what I see are nodding heads and uh, agreement with each other. And it's so nice for me to see uh, the participation. We have two professionals uh, in the um, well-being uh, and, and the psychology and psychologists uh, realm. And I'd like to uh, welcome, of course, Nutella. Nut uh, Al Karushi, um, who is a founder and managing director of the psychology department at Al Harub Medical Center. Welcome, Nutella. Nutella. Thank you. 
Kushi Makal, um, also a, counts, a counseling psychologist and head of psych, psych, psychometrics. I must that earlier. I know psychometrics so well <laughs> uh, in my field. Uh, corporate health at Al Harub Medical Center. Um, we depend so much in the schools on your good work. Uh, both of you. Uh, I know you're passionate uh, psychologists. Um, I, I'd like to start with you, Mutela. Um, your belief in holistic, uh, your holistic approach was so interesting to me as I read about your private practice, uh, your academic motivation, um, monthly column that you have written, your work with both adolescents and adults. Um, I really um, was fascinated by your work. Would you help us today what kind of stresses have you been seeing uh, during this pandemic time since March 18th and the announcement of online schooling? Uh, thank you, Sue, for the question. Uh, so, you know, as everyone mentioned before, it's an uncertain time for all of us. Uh, and of course, it would be normal for us to experience some form of anxiety, stress, or fear during this uh, pandemic. So um, I would say for some parents um, that I have come uh, across, uh, you know, this new reality demands basically superhuman juggling for them, right? So uh, with the online uh, uh, learning. So for parents have to um, juggle various roles right now. They have to navigate being a parent, a homemaker, a spouse, an employee. And now with the online train, uh, uh, online learning and educator as well. So it's tough for some parents, they're doing a really great job, but many others uh, are struggling. Um, and then you, let's not forget the parents, um, you know, uh, that have more than one child uh, to homeschool. They have to supervise each child, make sure that they're doing their schoolwork. They have to teach them if they're unable to grasp a certain subject or uh, concept. Uh, and not to mention the different, uh, you know, the kids that go to different schools. Uh, these parents have to nav navigate the various online uh, school platforms. So that's additional stress right there. Uh, so with the students um, or the adolescents, uh, you know, their, um, the, the stress that they're experiencing, well, you know, their lives have been suddenly uprooted like all of us, right? So we can relate. Their schools have been shut down. They can't socialize with their friends. They're homebound. Uh, they don't have extracurricular activities and so on. Um, um, and then let's not forget also the, the students with, the, you know, poor infrastructure, um, you know, they, uh, they have to share a device at home. They have other family uh, members that need the internet bandwidth for um, other things. So that's additional stress for them uh, when it comes to the online uh, learning. So what I would recommend uh, for them to cope with the, uh, the stress of online learning uh, or what this pandemic has uh, uh, brought uh, forth uh, I would have uh, maybe parents and, and kids, um, you know, adhere to some kind of structure and routine, as was the case pre-COVID-19. Uh, uh, kids feel safe when they know what to expect. I would also uh, recommend being open and flexible. Um, you know, if you're not able to manage um, the, the schoolwork, I would say, you know, it's okay. Do whatever you can and communicate that uh, to the school. Uh, remember, we're all in this together. The schools and educators themselves are trying to navigate this new normal. Um, and I would be also, I would recommend that to be open and acknowledge your feelings. Um, and model that as well to your kids. It's, it's okay to feel uh, fear and it's okay to be anxious, uh, but what you do in response to these feelings is quite important. Um, and I would say physical activity is really quite important. Uh, you know, when you're physically active, you, uh, there's an increase of endorphins in your brain and that's the good feel uh, chemicals, neurotransmitters in your brain. Um, so also go out, 30 minutes, I would recommend 30 minutes if the weather in Oman permits, um, get some um, vi vitamin D or some sunlight uh, that also increases uh, uh, some chemical levels in your brain uh, that uh, promote positive uh, moods. 
Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. But my overall message I would say is that, you know, it's a tough time for everyone. Uh, we're all navigating this new normal. So I say, take a deep breath and let yourself off the hook just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, uh, I so appreciate that. And as you yeah. were uh, speaking, I wrote down it's new territory and we're all learning as we go. Um, yeah. And even as long as I've done this, uh, people turn to me as an expert and we have to realize this is new territory for everyone. Exactly. And so we need to support each other, all these experts um, here and around the world, we're turning to each other for support. Uh, so uh, that's something I, I uh, realized during this whole this whole phase, these 80 some days since March 18th, it's been a, an extraordinary time. And we turn to professionals and you turn to us and we turn to each other. So it's been extraordinarily helpful to, to have these webinars. Thank you so much. Um, I have one other quick question. Uh, I think you almost answered it. Uh, what are the tips for uh, duration and frequency of screen time in general? Do you have a quick answer for that? And then I want to get to Rupa. Okay. Uh, well, the literature on the ideal duration and frequency for online classes, especially for kids that are not yet in college, uh, is quite novel. But I'm sure that researchers are currently looking into it, given what is happening right now. However, what, I, what we do know from uh, the research is that student engagement drops significantly when videos um, is longer than 9 to uh, 12 minutes, therefore breaking it up um, you know, breaking up the information, delivering it uh, shorter 15 to 20 minute uh, sessions uh, would be beneficial for uh, the kids, especially if they're younger and can actually boost uh, learning. Yeah. Is that enough? Or should I, do Thank I have you. time it's to add? Wonderful. Okay. okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Rupa Koshi Makal, uh, your counseling uh, psychologist and what I loved reading about you was your mindfulness, and I know that uh, your uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I, what I've seen is uh, quite a bit of anxiety and depression, but you're also known as someone who gives a good counseling and ex executive functioning. And that's something we, we know that students need help with in normal times. Uh, have you seen swing in that? Um, and uh, this is a longer question, I know, as mindfulness is one of your uh, specialties, how can, how can that uh, be worked into our present lockdown situation in Oman, especially for children, mindfulness? Yeah, it's unfortunate that this pandemic has had such a widespread impact on everyone in our community. And unfortunately, even the children, regardless of their age, have not been exempted from this Parents are very bound to experience a lot of anxieties because a lot of pressure has been put on them. And yes, a uh, lot of relaxation techniques have now been made freely available online uh, for individuals in the community to be able to manage some of that uh, expectation that they put on themselves and they imagine that the community has on themselves as well. Um, as far as possible, Parents can try to normalize this situation like many of my colleagues have already mentioned in terms of mindfulness, being very aware of your present situation and being aware that the, the plan is not to think about the long term right now, but to focus primarily on the short term, to focus on the problems at hand focusing on the pressures at hand and solving one problem at a time without expecting you to uh, solve every single issue that you try to come up with. Um, one of the things that my colleague Nutella mentioned was, you know, sometimes parents can get very overwhelmed because a lot of the pressure has unfortunately fallen on them. But if uh, they do experience stressors from their work and stressors from um, educating their child, take, it, take, take a step back. Um, you don't have to do everything perfectly. It's not meant to be that way right now. Um, as far as possible, keep that channel of communication transparent and educate yourselves and the children 
on the viral contamination and what is going on in the society and even speak to them about it. You can actually tell the young children, um, you know, everyone can catch a virus and fall sick at different points in time. But right now as a community, we need to help the hospitals. We're trying to help the doctors uh, not get too overwhelmed by making too many people fall sick. So we do need to practice washing our hands, wearing the mask, maintaining physical distances. Um, and a lot of material is available online for the parents as well. And uh, the community, thankfully, is very, very supportive. So don't hesitate to ha ask for help and to look for help uh, should it be required. So a message of reason. I, I appreciate that. With a whole world, a whole world now, um, dependent on, on the screen. Children don't move and have outdoor time the way they do at school. How will that impact their health, physical and mental, little people to teenagers? Yeah, this is not the first global crisis that the world is witnessing. <laughs> and something that's very admirable about the human nature is that intense resilience we have in the face of uh, difficulty. So that inbuilt resilience is something that we all need to harness during this time and something that all educational and health specialists have emphasized on from the very beginning of this pandemic has been set a routine, set a routine, set a routine. Uh, and I think having you know, that fairly flexible routine for children to follow, a time to wake up, a time for chores, a time for studying, uh, will assist them in staying busy and have, they will have a fair idea of how this day is going to go. Um, and these routines do have to be modified and they have to be very flexible and educators also should have a very clear understanding and parents as well, that not every day is going to be what you had imagined it to be. So basically, follow the routine that the schools have emphasized. Have some time for work in the daily curriculum. But have some time for some physical activity and also to encourage some creativity. The whole idea is for our children down the line to look back on the memory of this pandemic and reflect by saying, yeah, it was a difficult time, but I do have some pretty good memories as well. Uh, encourage social behaviors that children are practicing, particularly adolescents who thrive on these social relationships. And for the younger children, setting up playing play dates or having online competitions or games that include some kind of physical movement. And so many videos are now freely available online for them to engage in physical activities at home. In mental health, we have a technique called uh, behavioral activation, and it emphasizes on our behaviors and our actions to enhance three main domains. Uh, that can help us lead a worthwhile life. The first one being having a sense of achievement for accomplishing a task or having learned something new. Uh, the second is to improve our relationships by spending quality time with a family member or a loved one. Uh, and the third is some personal enjoyment, having some time to indulge your own needs and taking care of your own self. Incorporating these three elements into the day-to-day -day routine in education and otherwise will probably help you lead a fairly balanced lifestyle. All good if point. There, Thank I you. can see you. Go ahead. All good points and thank you very much. You know, we also have two educators and two parents with us on the panel. Uh, today. I'd like to turn now to the teachers. Uh, Mehal uh, Iqbal is a teacher at Al Zain Nursery and Shakira Wadi is a PYP educator at my school private school. And I'd like to turn first to uh, Mehal. Uh, you teach very young children, right Mehal? Yes. Yeah, I teach uh, preschoolers till KG1. Okay. Oh, so you have the littlest of our children. In, I have in the a smallest ones ever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I imagine, I suspect that going online was hard for you to lose contact with your students, right? Oh my God, it breaks my heart. Uh, I think the, I think to begin with, really the um, the emotional gap that's growing. It's been so difficult to um, fill it up because physically I'm not quite there to help the children. I'm not there physically present to cheer them because let's admit it. Even if I'm an English teacher, um, I'm not just going to the nursery to teach the kids A to Z. I'm, a, I'm literally uh, teaching the kids how to hold a spoon in my classroom. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so it begins from all the little things. So it's been quite difficult, but I mean, if we're having this conversation now, it means that the virtual classrooms have been successful. So that's good. Uh, how many children were in your class? Uh, so um, uh, from two to three year olds, I had 18. And for the graduating class at the KG1 students, I had around 15. So many of the parents that I run into say, I can't even control one. How could she control 18? Uh, so, uh, and do you have children at home? May I ask personally, do you have children at home? No, I don't. No, I don't have children on my own. And uh, what was your online teaching responsibility? Um, so, okay, uh, see, now, I think uh, as what Mr. Rakesh said as well, that we have had to really quickly uh, adopt and set up virtual classrooms, you know, as the new norm. And we as educators, what I feel that we're doing is quite evolutionary because in a very short span of time, just so quickly, we've just had to adapt and set up virtual classrooms and make sure that they work. So how we ensure that the traditional classroom can also be similar to virtual classroom is trying to incorporate the same elements. So uh, like at the nursery, uh, we have like three layered learning techniques, all right? Uh, quickly speaking, it'd be like an oral guide, a visual guide, and a physical activity. So what we did, we applied the same technique in our virtual classrooms as well. Hmm. Uh, um, I'm the visual guide where the kids are watching what Ms. Mahal is doing, what I'm speaking or what I'm instructing will be the oral guide, Whereas the physical activity is the completion of the activity that we have been doing. So we try to um, incorporate the three layered activity or the three layered learning technique in our virtual classrooms as well. So we were successful to do that. So much of early childhood education is play to learn, learning negotiating yeah. skills, sharing, show and tell, passing, playground fairness, Yes. You know, we, how is this done online? We know that it's really hard with kids. It's really hard, yes. Uh, uh, I think what, uh, Ms. Stu, what I would like to begin saying over here is that yes, for the past three months, these kids have been at home, all right? Uh, but before that, at the six months, these kids were with me. I mean, I'm their teacher. I know them inside out, all right? I know what makes this kid grumpy. I know what makes them happy. I know what they're interested in. I know what, you know, who's going to cause the biggest mess of glitter in my classroom. I know them. So that has really helped because I know my students. These three months have been really tough. But before that, I mean, I'm their teacher. I'm a familiar face. I did not just pop out of somewhere teaching them on the laptop. So my kids know me. So that familiarity that we created has really helped them understand that, okay, this is my teacher. So if my teacher is asking her to do something, Oh, we were doing it like three months ago. Why wouldn't we do it now? I would want you to teach my children. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so. and the other thing is that, I mean, what we tried to do is that we, uh, we allowed it to be a free space. Um, from the nursery side, Ms. Sue, we sent home like this, um, uh, what, do you, what we can say like a monthly pack. So that pack contained all the stationery, it contained all the crafts, all the lessons. So whatever the teacher is using in front of her, the kids have it in front of them as well. So we're starting to clear like a familiarity that if I'm holding a piece of paper, I don't want my kids to feel left out. You get what I mean? They also have the same paper at home, so they're familiar with what's happening. So what I found is that the creativity of teachers was in... It, it just blossomed in online learning. Yes. The, the creativity of teachers amazed me during this online seismic shift. And congratulations to you. Thank you, you so I, much, Ms. Yeah, I'd Thank like you. to shift to Shakira. Um, and um, I know that you're a PYP educator. And what grade do you teach, Shakira? I also teach grade one and mm. I work with children in the community as well in the afternoons on a volunteer basis where they are in the higher grades. And so how long have you been teaching? How, how I'm long? teaching 
in grade one, I, it is my sixth year, three years back in South Africa and three years here within the PYP system. And in the higher grades, I've also been teaching for about three years. And did you have much preparation uh, from, for the switch from classroom teaching to online teaching? Because our methodology of learning is where we are the facilitators, and it's very open and it is guiding the children uh, to take their skills and to transfer it in their own context, regardless of the context. It didn't really, met, uh, it didn't really affect us. It wasn't such a big step. In fact, I was really impressed with the way in which the children, they uh, took ownership of the learning and we became the learners. Just like um, Maria Montessori, she says, we can now step back and it's as if the children are learning and we are not there. And uh, what is also very impressive is, like it's been said before, is where the village came together, the families were involved and they were helping the children. They were not even helping. They, at first they were worried, how do we teach? And I told them, don't worry, it's okay. We don't even teach in the classroom. What you need to do is you need to learn with them and you will also be amazed because the children, they transferred uh, what they were, their skills that were working on the content into their own environment. They inspired each other and then they took it further. If I give an example, we were uh, inquiring into how plants can help the environment, especially in the COVID-19. And in one of our little webinars, we never had where I was teaching during our Google Meet sessions, we had little webinars like these. And so I was trying to, I noticed that some of the kids were not doing the practical activities. So I was trying to encourage them. And one of the children went and fetched his plant and he showed it. And within a few days, it had already grown so much. And after that, it was a ripple effect where all the children were planting different kinds of vegetables. And the fathers were showing the skills and the children were giving the commentary and they were sending videos of them just sitting at night and having discussions. It was amazing. And also going back to of us teachers being ready, I really owe um, a lot of gratitude, the whole staff, to our management who took it on the first day after they announced the lockdown. The management said, this is not a challenge. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity of growth and learning for all of us. So that really helped to ease the process. There was a lot of support in identifying the barriers. We gave the parents a lot of support where we guided them step by step on how to get connected. And once they connected, they really saw the value of the child engaging with their peers and taking the inspiration from the peers. Shakira, when I hear you speak, it's what I know and believe about teachers. This incredible um, uh, unlimited resources that you can tap to educate children and I'm inspired by you and your enthusiasm and the the joyfulness that I heard in in you speaking and how you engage the, the family and there is something that will be um, remembered by the children about this time. And there may be even something that they say was special about this time. It's, it's wonderful how educators have been striving to, to bridge this gap for a long time about the practical and the, what they're learning in classrooms. And um, I commend you and Mahal, it's, it's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank and you. we'll hear from our parents now. Uh, um, we have two parents with us and we'll come back. I think I saw smiles uh, from those of us who are trying very hard to understand managing these aspects of uh, the shift, this shift from in class to online. And is it working? Did it work? We can always, always improve, always. Um, but let's hear from the parents now, because certainly there were, there were some children who did not have the technology, and how did we uh, provide for them? There were certainly children who had uh, disabilities, and how did we provide for them? This is not perfect, uh, but we, um, and we want to constantly improve, constantly. We want to look at how we did and prepare for next year 
Uh, but we want to hear from the parents now. Um, and we have uh, Sue Hunt. Um, and Sue, you have a five-year-old? Yes, I do. And, uh, and Suparna uh, Barnaji? Um, uh, oh, uh, on my screen, I have to just find you, Suparna. Yeah. Uh, Suparna, you have two children? Yes, that's right. They're both teenagers, 12 and 14. <laughs> okay, so 12 and we, then we will hear from both uh, sides of the conversation. So I'll start with you, Sue. Um, uh, does your child feel motivated to uh, attend uh, the online classes? Uh, is it a he or she? She. She, she. Uh, when she uh, uh, the same kind of motivation as when she went to school. Well, um, Sue, great question because um, I had to get creative to keep her motivated. I okay. mean, she's a little one. Um, we would we would watch online the the classroom instruction or the fabulous ideas that the teachers gave us, but she started to get distracted and want to do something else. So we just, we got creative. I had to get a schedule together. I put a routine together. Um, the teachers were so inspiring, are so inspiring with their ideas that we put together a daily routine schedule and, and followed it um, to, to keep her motivated. And, and so your role has been uh, as, uh, you, you took quite an active role. With a yes. five, you'd have to as with a five-year-old. Yes, we we started off thinking, oh, this is fun, this is going to be good, and then you realize it, when the lockdown came down, I was her teacher, I was her mother, I was her daily instructor of what we we're going to do for the entire yeah. eight hours of the day. So once again, I had to come back to take the ideas from the school, get creative with with some new things. Um, we we had her watching um we have her watching doing exercises for kids on tv when sure. we came outside it's just all of a sudden there was all these new things that we had to do for her to um to, to have her learn and even as we at the school said we don't want you to change your role from being mother to teacher we didn't want you to have to shift that you you had to you felt that you had to set the routine and establish those things. We, we know how hard that was. And, and Suparna, um, I, at, at my school, we, with, a, with a ninth grade group, we um, had to at one point say, uh, we're giving too much homework. So, uh, and we had to pull back a little bit. So with your older students, did you, um, uh, are they grasping the concepts that we're trying to do with online learning? Did you, did you have, uh, did you feel they were getting the concepts through online learning? And uh, did you feel that there was a, a good balance of too much work, not enough work? Uh, as far as the concepts go, uh, yes, they are kind of able to grasp, even though it's online. Uh, the teachers are taking a lot of effort to explain the topics in entirety. And uh, then they are providing worksheets uh, web tutorials so that children can go online for further reference. So basically now children, because they are older children, they do have a lot of topics to cover and uh, to finish even uh, clarify their doubts. So all that is happening online. Uh, so that's why, yes, they are putting in efforts. Of course, that has made children a lot more independent. Initially, they used to go to the school they used to ask teachers uh, whatever doubts they had. And teachers were uh, at that instant able to clear their doubts. But now what they have to do is they, they need to send messages to the teachers, clarify their doubts. So it's happening only thing from the traditional classroom it has shifted to the virtual platform. Uh, it, is, uh, it was initially difficult for them but uh, children being children, they are now very comfortable and uh, they are making the most of it. In fact, it took us a little bit longer to adjust to the whole system because we have to constantly keep monitoring what they are doing. Are they really attending the classes? Are they able to understand, retain what they have to do? Are they finishing their assignments? Are they sending it to the teachers? Are they doing uh, 
all the worksheets on Google Classroom and uh, getting it checked by the teacher, informing the teacher beforehand. Uh, now it's all streamlined. <laughs> Well, they sound like very academic kids. And one of the things that I have to remind myself that it is June and at the end of the school year, that happens quite naturally that we have to remind children to do their assignments. Uh, it is quite a natural thing at the end of the school year that that happens usually. Yes, yes. We are, we have such a rich panel, and, and Rakesh, I saw you nodding your head, and M Mahal and Ropa, I saw you nodding your head, Tommy, quite, quite often you were smiling. Uh, this is such a rich panel. Are there, uh, could you raise your hand if, if you wanted to react uh, to something that, that, that happened earlier, and I'll call on you at this time, because we have a few minutes now. I have, mm -hmm. Extra questions. Rakesh, I saw you come up just quickly. I have a few questions in general. One of them that I'd like you to think about, and, and I'll come back to Rakesh, you're first. Um, I'd like you to think about, we've, we've been focusing uh, on many of our panels about uh, so many of the, the very hardships that we've had throughout our pandemic and the online learning, what we've given up, what we've lost about our learning. And certainly none of us would have chosen to go to online. The, the richness that we have in class, the, the, the things that we know that teachers do in their classroom. Mahal, you lit up when you talked about your students. Shakira, what you, when you talk about your students, even when Sue talked about classroom, experience uh, both from the parent and the student side we know that students and teachers are meant to be together but we have we have done something terrific and our psychologists have said we've we've had worse and let's not forget that there have been worse things and we've had technologies to support us throughout this time so we've done pretty well and in Oman we've done very well We've done extremely well uh, health-wise and uh, supporting each other. But I'd like you to think about maybe some of the, the things that will be positive throughout uh, this time. Rakesh, what would you like to say at this time? I wanted to, you know, add about uh, adding routine to the daily life. I... The schools during the time of lockdown we are the only happening thing in the society. The children on the five working days, we are getting up on time, getting ready for the class, being the new mode of and the medium of education. The entire family was getting up on time. It has added so much of physical, mental, emotional movement to the entire family that the family has positively, very optimistically has moved out of that crisis time and they were looking forward to life post COVID. That was something knowingly, unknowingly school did for each one of us. So when Rupa was talking about routine, this was a wonderful thing that kept us active, that kept us inspiring, that kept us motivating, giving a new exercise every day to live for, looking forward to the next day has kept our family life very happy and active. The places, I was yesterday reading an article, the places where the schools have not started, like in India, the summer break, you know, came in in the May and June, the rate of domestic violence has gone up. People were not knowing what to do and what not to do. Children were not having a work to do. So what happened, the school in place like in Muscat has very actively has done a role of, you know, keeping a mental wellness to some extent. Then taking further lead, you know, the online classes, as we talk about the stressful, is a mix of many activities. It is not like watching a cartoon channel on a TV. It has an activity. It has a teacher who comes on the screen and engages you it has a teacher it has a moderator who keeps a switch on your video and give me answer to this question there is an element of alertness to it 
So attending an online classes and attending a webinar and attending, you know, a watching a movie are different uh, feeling altogether. So assuming that if my child is attending, you know, 30 minutes or 35 minutes class and he gets a stress or he gets some type of, you know, uh, eye strain and all that. Believe me, every school is making a class of that 30, 35 minutes an active class, which has an element of video, which has an element of listening, which has an element of manipulating being used, which has an element of interaction and discussion. So these classes are not as, you know, uh, weird and as uh, the society thinks of it. It's very well engaging it. Yes, I do agree that in a day we need to decide whether it should be four lessons a day or three lessons a day or for KG only one lesson a day. That sensibility the school has to bring it into the system. With those type of alertness, yeah, we are on the right track to do well. Thank you. I have a, a question. Uh, as, we, as we head into the summer and we're still in lockdown, how will you delineate school online from recreation or recreation for your children? There was always a marker uh, from school to summer for the children. And there's very little marker right now for them to say, ah, school's out for summer. <laughs> and to say that it's done. Now take a break. I think, I think there's, there's just got to be some kind of a celebration and we need to have something to say we just sort of slipped into summer or this break the permission to say now it's okay to read for fun and now it's okay to take a break so how about it our our parents and our tommy maybe even <laughs> you can help us with this um, Nutella, do you, or do you have any, uh, oh, I, and in fact, I guess, Rakesh, you don't have a break, do you? No, we, we do have. See, we, we are not, you know, uh, like robots who are working. <laughs> we, we get uh, into something called, you know, intellectual fatigue, <laughs> where we, we, you know, we stop, you know, thinking uh, beyond a certain point. All Indian schools, they have announced, you know, two-week break at the end of the June which is coming as a bit. Many Indian schools are also thinking of a summer camp, virtual summer camp that okay. will give children something out of their textbooks. All right. Many schools are doing their physical education classes online, which make children dance, jump and do yoga in front of the camera. Many schools are doing their virtual art classes. Children are sitting with the art sheet and doing it. It is beyond core subject teaching in many cases. It has gone beyond English, maths, and science. The creative aspect of the schooling has also brought in the class. Schools are doing assembly. We did our each celebration online when it was uh, there in the newspaper not to have a gathering and all that, but we did it. Schools have to be creative. School has to go beyond a normal. As you said, a new normal, we have to go beyond and then think something different to do it. I believe we have a huge, we still have to see the good of digital learning happening. We, we are on the journey. We have not reached to the ultimate uh, best, right? Every day is a new day for everybody. An enriching holistic approach. Yeah. Right. I have, um, perhaps for Rupa and Nutella, I have a, a question and I think this will be the last and then I'll take, um, if you have something uh, you'd like to say to the group. Um, with all the talk of pandemic, many little children didn't and don't understand what exactly is going on. They know there's something scary and sometimes someone might get sick and even die. Could you give some advice to parents on approaching a child who appears unusually fearful? Um, okay. I'll uh, okay. Rupa, you want me to take this and then you can add? <laughs> yeah, sure. You can okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so what I would recommend is uh, uh, speak to your, your, your kids and let them, as I mentioned before, it's, it's important for, for them to understand that it's okay to be afraid. Help them uh, 
understand what is it that is going on. Uh, there are these great videos online uh, that uh, educate uh, the kids depending on their, um, you know, their age and all that, ha what, what is happening, what is coronavirus and, and so on. So it's very important not to give them too much information as well. And it's also important to you as a parent, if you don't know the answers and they ask you something, just be honest and say, you know, I'll get back to you. Let me like investigate that uh, and so on. Um, I think uh, uh, children are quite resilient. Um, you can equip them with the skills. You can actually teach them mindfulness uh, skills as well that can uh, help them be more present oriented and by default they become more relaxed. It's important for kids to understand and label uh, and identify their emotions. Um, mm -hmm. I would also um, you know recommend as well um, for them to do like a gratitude exercise you know have them have a jar paint it and and every day um, before they go to bed you know put something in that jar and let them uh, ask them what is it that they're grateful for um, but uh, yeah uh, I don't know if Rupa you want to add to yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of research has gone into showing how children model uh, behaviors that they see from primary caregivers and significant adults that they are exposed to so we yeah. would like to encourage parents teachers to regulate their own anxieties as well focus on your self-care predominantly one of the parents had mentioned how suddenly they were put into this role of teacher parent caregiver everything all at the same time your care your self-care is also very important to the child and they very often model those behaviors offer them that safe space to talk about those anxieties all these feelings should always be validated and if parents find that the children are exp expressing a lot of what we call what if questions what if i am sick what if i get my grandparents sick what if i never see my friends again uh, people, you know parents can help children by trying to identify and this is a technique we use uh, in therapy trying to identify if there is any concrete evidence to show that these anxieties could possibly be or suggestively be true uh, and if there is no evidence to say that then we can teach this child a technique that we like to call channel switching where we teach the child that you know imagine that your mind is like a television set and you don't like the channel that you're watching because it's causing you some kind of distress so let's change that channel and parents can help the children change the channel by diverting their attention so engage in some kind of an activity help you know the parent with cooking or talk to a friend if possible play a game together as a family but with older children uh, this technique might not work with older children communication is the best way to go through this so what Natalia said keep that channel open acknowledge that you don't have all the answers acknowledge that their feelings are valid and it's quite normal it's a frightening time and the world has been through this before the professionals are working very hard to get through this keeping that line of communication open between older children and the parents will also assist in the family bond while everybody is cooped up in the house together so like someone said earlier not everything hopefully is too bad and hopefully with these different techniques we can mitigate some of these uh, problems the parents might possibly face Thank you very much. This uh, panel reminds me again that together we will all get through this, uh, the expertise all together. Uh, I want to come back to that question about uh, do we see some good that has come through this? Of course, we don't, we never wanted to be in this position. I'd ask two of you, uh, it, can you uh, think of some things that we will look back on this and say, we did learn this? Is there anyone that would like to answer that? Yes, Shakara? Shakara? Uh, you have to unmute. <laughs> we had a student uh, with us in the previous year, and he has a condition called Fanconi anemia, which is very similar to what we're going with yet to constantly monitor his immune uh, what he was exposing his immune system to he had to constantly watch uh, what he was eating some days he could come to school some days he couldn't come to school some days he came to school with a mask 
But one thing that inspired, so the children got used to the situation. It just shows how amazing that was before that time. But one thing that inspired us and uh, about him is his appreciation for every day. He would wake his mom up and say, let's go to school. I need to go to school. Let's go to school. It's time to go to school. And even in the classroom, he would open the door, swing it open, greet his friends. He would do a robot dance to come and collect things. He'd be the first one to finish his lunch and dash outside to play. So uh, he taught us, and it's the same thread that has been in discussions with all my colleagues, is that we now have appreciation for the little things our social interactions. We have appreciation for being, some days you don't want to wake up and go to work. Now we have appreciation for waking up and going to work. We have appreciation for learning from the kids. And just to build on what Tommy said earlier is, um, okay, one of my favorite quotes from His Majesty, the late Sultan Kabuz bin Said, is that we will educate our children even if it is under a tree. And I think this is what we have done. We have educated our children under, even despite the circumstance. And if we look forward and we align now with the Oman 2040 vision, we will push our children forward to reaching their true potential because that focuses on youth empowerment. So it's about this time was a time for us to learn from the children. It was a time for us to reflect and to realize our true potential. Yeah. Quite inspiring, thank you. Tommy, you leaned in. Did you um, want to say something or? I just wanted to add to what Shakra just mentioned. Like, um, I think the, the past three months have actually um, uh, empowered countries to actually look into their infrastructure. So I'm more of a technology person, so I'm looking into the infrastructure and whatnot. So like, let's take Oman, for example. Like Oman has actually proved that it's technologically ready for such a, pandemic in terms of network infrastructure, service, solutions, and also um, uh, security, uh, where, by which uh, Oman is rated among the top 10 in the world as well. So I would say the pandemic has brought the best among, among many of us. There have been, there are, there are uh, let's say, certain countries, like mostly from Eastern Europe, who've also um, exposed their free online tools to other countries who do not have the infrastructure already. So this kind of also brought out from a technology standpoint, uh, lots of proprietary software and learning modules or LMS systems to be available free of cost for countries and, and, and institutions to, to grab. So uh, that's just from the way I see things, why I could not see these things for free before, and they're actually free now. That shows the, uh, the, the art of working together towards the problem. Well, everything I read about your optimism is true, and His Majesty Sultan Haitha is a, a wonderful vision for Oman. Let's hope for a better future. So I, um, with that, I really hope that you have enjoyed this as much as I have. A thank you to the Oman American Business Center, OABC, and Apex Media, and Muscat Daily for organizing this webinar today. I hope you've enjoyed the informed opinions of your panel of experts today. I thank you for joining us, and I commend you, the audience. We have a large audience today. Uh, for your investment in the education of the children of Oman. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank Good you. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.